Fire is a series that doesn't revolve around romances, but sure happens to have a good amount of them. Not all of them are good, not all of them are bad. Four out of the five books within the first arc contain romances with the main character, with the obvious exception being Sunny. With such a prominent focus, I figured it was only fair to give my opinion on those ships. Before we get started, if you are new to this channel, please think about subscribing. I regularly post both Wings of Fire and the Warrior Cats content so you'll never be bored. And to my current subscribers, thank you so much for supporting me, I moved on here without y'all. Now without further ado, let's talk about love. Ship number one, Clairol. I have to admit, I like this ship a bit. Clay and Pearl are foils to each other and it makes for an interesting dynamic between them, but I'm not sure why I like it for both Pearl and Clay, romantically, and I don't know whether it would fit into the books or not. I already went over how complicated this ship can be in my Pearl video, but I'm just going to recap the points I made there. Pearl was borderline obsessed with Clay as he was the first dragon to show her any positive attention around her age range. She also idealizes his actions and uses him as a pinnacle of morality and a way to see whether her own actions are wrong or not. Her and Clay gang together may be good, but only for a Pearl. She has a free therapist pretty much, or at least another dragon who can control her actions and rein her in. People are not required to fix or be a therapist or a partner, especially if their partner is abusive. In this case, Peril is not, however, she has killed at least 100 dragons in the arena, and there's an obvious problem that needs to be fixed with her, likely trauma and an untangling killing from receiving rewards, as she does sometimes feel tempted to kill people, like Winter. Clay might feel pressured into staying in a relationship with her so she doesn't act out because of that burden. There also isn't much evidence on his end that he even likes her. Peril tends to over-exaggerate and be an unreliable narrator when it comes to relationships due to her childhood social isolation. Peril thinks that brushing wings means that they are soulmates. This relationship is not good on both sides, therefore I don't think it's that good. I can see the dynamic of ball of fire x calm water like some people do, however I feel like Sunlu does it way better and in a much healthier way. If the ship did occur, I feel like both characters need a bit more development. From Peril, we need to see that she can be independent and does not have to rely on Clay for morality, and for Clay, we need to get some signs that he actually likes her besides a wingtip brushing or something like that, something from another character's perspective. This ship has to be a B for me, not the worst, but it could use some improvements. Our next ship is Ripnami. As I was rereading the books, I realized that this was the most mediocre ship in the entire series. I simply just don't think it was necessary. Their first scene together seemed designed to make them fall in love for no reason. Riptide mistakes Tsunami's aquatic for a sign that she likes him. According to tropes, why would this misunderstanding turn into prophecy? The two begin to have a relationship over the course of Tsunami's aquatic lessons, but beyond that it never really is established. We don't get to see their chemistry outside those moments, and even then, in those moments it isn't much. Tsunami's personality doesn't match very well with Riptide's, and I'm not even sure what Riptide's personality is to be honest, he's just quiet, kind of determined a tiny bit of sneaky and evil, because he turns out to be working for an organization that held Tsunami and her friends captive for years, and they only just escaped. I don't see fierce Tsunami being okay with that under any circumstances, she isn't that forgiving and tends to be rather vengeful. We see them together again to almost 12 books later in The Dangerous Gift. During the time in between, they've been writing letters as JMA and the Talents of Peace are close to each other and letters can travel easily. They are cute together and are a tiny bit affectionate. I don't really see Tsunami's love language being close contact to be honest, so that's another point against it. I assume they physically met up off page and Tui forgot to tell us, but if they didn't, I'm not sure how Tsunami fell in love with a dragon she hardly met and who betrayed her within the first days of them meeting each other. This ship has to reach a C for me, it's mediocre and doesn't make sense for Tsunami. I would give it a higher rating if it was actually entertaining and it didn't sound like she put it in just for the sake of filling pages. Next up, give a big cheer for Glorybringer! I made a video on the ship a few months ago, so my opinions should be solid. Or is it? A few things have changed from then to now, and a few new things have come up that have changed my opinion. First of all, a lot of people were telling me that Tui did officially retcon the Age of Deathbringer on social media. So I put up a community post and asked anyone for evidence in the form of a link. Despite many people telling me that they knew 100% for sure this had happened, no link ever did appear. One thing that did appear was a quote in Winter Turning where Winter describes Deathbringer as being a few years older than him, and Winter's only around five years old or so according to the wiki. However, I'd like to point out that Winter Turning came out before Assassin. Winter Turning was released in July, and Assassin was released in September of the same year. So maybe Deathbringer was not retconned to be younger, but older, which makes it a tiny bit more complicated. Because Assassin was released after Winter Turning, it should contain the most up-to-date information. However, it is a novel which kind of cancels the 
out as novels are a secondary source. Deathbringer, in my opinion, is the age that he was an assassin because it was the latest released. Unless that magical screenshot to he's saying that Deathbringer's now young again shows up, I will consider him to be that age. The age might not really matter in the long run because in a recent interview, Tui confirms that she does not have an age chart, which explains how an enemy, aka teenage angst, and toddler type mink are the same age. This was a ticketed event, so I don't have to clip, but according to the Pyrian Times, this is the gist of what she said it matters to age. What is the comparison of human to dragon years? The DoD are 6, making them teenagers in human years around 14 to 17. 7 years old is not when dragons are fully grown, and it's just when their growth starts slowing down. There isn't any specific correlation between dragonettes and human years. I thought that Dragonettes of Destiny were 7, however, I guess they were 6 in the original series and now they're 7 because a year's gone by. Another thing that this screenshot tells us is that dragon maturity is not connected to their growth. They may keep on being immature to a certain age like 11 or so. I personally choose to believe that Gloria is at the upper end of the age spectrum as she mentioned for 6 year old dragons. I'm honestly a bit annoyed that Tui didn't make an age chart, it leads to a lot of discrepancies in how dragonettes act, and is leading to a lot of infighting in the fandom. I'd rather she make shit up after the fact and then just say it's, it's real to be frank. So the age gap is in a bit of a gray area right now, but I still like to be cautious about it as it won't harm anyone. I'd also like to correct my statement that there is a power imbalance here. There is not. Glory is a queen and Deathbringer is an assassin, one who is currently unemployed. If anyone had more power, it would most likely be Glory. Glory has also killed slash injured more dragons than Deathbringer did, at least shown on page, as she injured Scarlet and a Nightwing guard who she threw down a ravine. She also killed Fajordan Crocodile, making her kill count one above Deathbringer's cannonball, that being Hurricane. I reiterate my opinion that even if the age gap was not suspicious and was not written in the first place, it is not a good ship in the release in my opinion. I don't appreciate the dynamic of man being protective over a woman and think she's vulnerable, but in reality, she's strong and independent. It sounds like a point from one of those mediocre feminist action movie remakes. Also, this may just be my perspective and a tiny bit of a reach, but Deathbringer is a bit protective of Glory. Not in a fun romantic way, but in a possessive way where he feels like she isn't capable of being out in the big scary world. Likely because she was raised under a mountain and maybe even not even his opinion, according to what he's seen. He's also harassed her a fair bit, which isn't fun or romantic, it is harassment. Deathbringer continuously disobeys Glory too, showing a lack of willingness on his part to listen to Glory's opinion, which is a bad sign in a relationship because relationships are all about communication. There's a lot of other ways to look at the ship. Literature is subjective and we all know that the fandom sometimes takes headcans and runs with it. But under the way that I read the ship, it's just not my type. This ship goes into my F tier, I just don't like it. Next up, Star Speaker. Star Speaker is one of the better ships on the first arc list. I like how they're kind of supposed to hate each other like the fake dragonettes and the real dragonettes all hate each other, however instead end up in a romance and bond over their lack of identity because they were born outside their tribe. I feel like their relationship progresses pretty rationally compared to other ships in the series. I love how they mutually support each other and both bring something to a relationship. Fate Speaker brings her undying optimism, and Starflight brings caution and also an undying thirst for knowledge. Their mutual support is really shown and developed as they start exploring the Night Kingdom and realize how messed up it is and how it doesn't live up to their own dreams of what the kingdom was, and escape from the torments of either the Guardians or their fellow prophecy dragonettes. Let's talk briefly about Sunny Flight. I don't really ship it, it's a case of show don't tell and it wasn't properly built up across the other books. Just a few lines about Starflight gazing longingly about her being worried about her for when she got injured would be enough, but instead it sprung on us at the last moment for drama. I've seen people critique Star Speaker by saying that it feels like Fate Speaker was Starflight's replacement for Sunny as she has a relatively similar personality and the two were even once jokingly called Soul Sisters, which goes to illustrate how alike they are. To that I say fair point, I don't have anything to rebuke that. I find it odd how Fate Speaker suddenly disappears from JMA. I thought she was going to be teaching there and helping out with Starflight, however she's gone the next book, with not even a note to say she's in a rainforest now. Tui just forgot about her, poor girl. Overall, it's a decent ship. I like it, I can see why others like it, but I feel like Sunny Speaker would be cuter and they get to bond over being considered annoying ones and always having their concerns ignored by the other dragonettes in our group. The only major problem with Sunny Speaker is that when you scroll too far down in the Tumblr tag, you start getting blazeball art. I don't know what blazeball is and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. This ship goes into the A tier, it's perfectly fine. Speaking of Sunny, I'm so glad we didn't get a ship in our book. 
It is the only main series WOF book where the main character isn't either in a relationship or set up to get into a relationship with someone. Tume wasn't that good at writing romances in the first series and it shows. In the later book, she's gotten better at doing so in a way that doesn't detract from the story and the main character. A good example of this was Lunatail. Even though they are separated from each other for most of the books, their romance is well executed when in when included. Luna also has her character built up quite well. Blue views her as strong and invulnerable, but in reality she struggles a lot with doing things daily. But in the earlier years, we, you can definitely see that she's having trouble letting the protagonist do their own thing whilst inputting the romance. Sunny is able to be fleshed out much more than the other DOD characters because Tui doesn't have to worry about developing any romantic relationships. We get to know about her insecurities because she's always overlooked despite feeling important, and how determined she is to prove everyone wrong when she feels something is right. Tui said she may give Sunny a romantic interest. I hope she doesn't. I had canned Sunny as aromantic and have done so since I saw a Sunny x Sunny shitpost on Scratch back in 2017. I don't think she needs a relationship too, she's fine as is. Needless to say, this is an S tier. Now it is time for a small ship roundup. These are ships not including the DoD that people have had over the years. First of all, Whirlpool X an enemy. People actually unironically ship Whirlpool with dragons and dragonettes and also romanticize some of the ships too. Evidence is on screen right now. This has to go into the F tier. Next, Blister Seer. I think it would be kind of toxic but also very fun, just two bastards in it for the politics who secretly want to kill each other. Gotta put this into A tier. Mangorchid, have to say that what we see from them is decent, they can't be apart from a day or so, and they are hopeless romantics. This goes into B tier. Blaze here has to be an A tier. As in Blaze and Glacier. Not Blaze and, you know, Moros here. Glacier seems to have a lot more emotions for an ally than the Coral and Blister or Burn and Scarlet, who literally used her as a human shield at one point. I think Naive Femme X Stoic Bitch is a good dynamic. I really wasn't sure Gl Glacier had emotions until book 14 though. This is A tier. Those are all the chips I could come up with. Is there any I forgot? How would you rank the ones I do have? Comment all that down below. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe. I make Wings of Fire and War Cats videos pretty often, and your support would mean a lot to me. And to those who are already subscribed, thank you for continuing to support. I wouldn't have gotten here without y'all. That's it. Rogan out. Have a nice day.